Hello and welcome to the presentation from Scott Harrison from Charity Water. He is the founder and CEO and I had the great pr privilege of seeing him present at a conference um, a couple months ago and was just blown away by his story and his passion and his enthusiasm and the change that he's making. He um, also has an amazing story of transformation. I know how much we love talking about career transformation. Believe it or not, he started out as a, um, a promoter of nightclubs in New York City. Is that right? And <laughs> I'm not exactly path. sure how he went from there to finding himself on a boat off the coast of Liberia, which is apparently, I'm sure he'll tell the story where he got inspired to change the world. Um, he also is a great friend of the, the technology community. He um, was alongside our CEO and founder at the, the Crunchies on Tuesday. He got runner up on the social impact award category. He runner, lost to Twitter. Lost to Twitter. It's pretty darn good. <laughs> You can't um, fight the revolution. No, you <laughs> cannot. Um, but he was also recently named as uh, one of the uh, top 40 under 40 um, people changing the world. And we are really lucky to have him here. And if, if you're so inspired, please tweet Status Update Away. They actually have an incredible presence in the social blogosphere. I think they have over 1.3 million followers at, at Charity Water. So let's um, help tell the world about Charity Water. Cool. Thank you. Thanks, Meg. All right, guys, I'm supposed to stay behind the podium, which is going to be really hard for me. <laughs> so if I start to wander, yell me back. Um, so, good, so good to be here. Uh, I got to spend a little time with, uh, with Reed yesterday and just uh, what an amazing kind of guy and generous community. I mean, I got a really sen a good sense of um, how much people at LinkedIn really care uh, about the world. And he sent me away with a bunch of ideas and my head spinning and um, all these things that we could be doing better. So I'm going I'm to share uh, my story, my kind of personal uh, backstory. I'm going to talk to you guys about uh, the water issue. And then I'm going to talk about um, our five-year uh, kind of journey, uh, starting Charity Water from zero to, um, to a couple million people served over the last five years. Um, I'll start my story uh, with, with something that happened that was really important uh, in my life when I was four years old. And my, uh, my family had moved uh, from Philadelphia to, uh, to a, an energy efficient house in South Jersey. And uh, unbeknownst to all of us, there was a gas leak in our home. And this was before carbon monoxide detectors. And I was thankfully spending a lot of time out of the house playing with my friends and at school. And my dad was working brutal hours at a, at a new job. And my mom is fixing up the house, breathing in carbon monoxide. And none of us knew this. And one day, uh, my dad watches her walk across the bedroom and collapse and you know, takes her in and over a, a period of, of tests, the doctors finally identified that um, she had been badly poisoned by carbon monoxide as it just leaked through these cracks uh, in, the, in the heat exchanger. And at four years old, I watched my mom go from, uh, from really a beautiful uh, woman uh, journalist uh, traveling around the world with my father um, to an invalid. So what had happened, instead of killing her, the carbon monoxide had just destroyed her immune system. So she went from you know, vibrant and healthy to uh, being allergic to just about anything you can imagine. Um, anything chemical really made her sick. An example of that, I remember as a kid, you know, my mom was an avid reader and a journalist, and uh, she couldn't read books anymore because the print would make her sick. The ink would make her sick in the book. So my dad and I would, would attempt to bake her books in the oven, which was so much fun as a kid because sometimes they lit on fire and you know, we would pull them out. and. Uh, but we would hand her these kind of, you know, slightly browned books. And if she wore cotton gloves um, so as to not touch the print, she could put the book inside a cellophane bag. And then with this mask on, uh, she, could, she could read. So she lived uh, her days outside. Uh, we moved to the country for better air quality. Um, and she lived indoors in a, in a bathroom covered in tinfoil. Uh, so a very bizarre kind of childhood growing up. Uh, I was an only child, you know, family planning stopped after the accident, and my parents just had a, a really deep and authentic Christian faith. Uh, they decided not to sue the gas company and believe that one day, you know, God would heal my mom and she would be restored to health. So I grew up, you know, the model Christian kid playing, you know, active in church and, you know, helping to take care of mom. And, uh, and then at 18, I guess like so many bad cliches, I rebel. And, you know, I grew my hair long, I moved to New York City, I joined a band, and I was gonna, you know, I was gonna show everybody, uh, I don't know, just how bad I could be. 
So I, I learned that um, th the best way to do that, or one of the best ways to do that, would be to fill nightclubs full of drunk people. And you could actually get paid a lot of money to do this job. Uh, so I was on the other side of the velvet rope, uh, filling up clubs. And if you got the right people in a club, you could charge extraordinary prices for alcohol. People would pay $16 for drinks, and they would spend $500 on bottles of vodka that cost us about 20 bucks to buy. Uh, and they would even buy multiple bottles if you had the right people there. So kind of from 18 to about 28, you know, I, I climbed up the, the social ladder in New York City nightlife. And this was, uh, this was a picture of my life at 28. I'm holding out the Rolex. What an idiot, right? So that the photographer notices that I actually have a Rolex. Um, I remember I was getting paid uh, $2,000 a month by Bacardi just to be seen in public drinking this vodka. Uh, and Budweiser paid me another $2,000 a month to drink Bud in public, uh, which we didn't think was enough. But, uh, you know, it was great. I, I was working two or three nights a week, and I was being sponsored by alcohol brands. And we were with all of the right people. We were flying around the world on other people's planes to fashion weeks. Um, it was a little darker of an existence the, the later uh, it got in the night, and this would have been a picture of me somewhere around three or four in the morning. So I, I had lots of issues. Uh, you know, I had, I had some, some drug issues, I had some gambling issues, pornography, I mean, you, you name it. It was a, a pretty dark uh, life and existence. And I realized um, really how, how low I'd sunk uh, on, a, on a trip to South America, to Punta del Este in Uruguay. And I was with all of the right people and I remember we had servants and horses at this house and we spent a thousand dollars on fireworks and you know I, I was driving a BMW and I had the watch and I had a grand piano in my apartment and I had a you know a beautiful dog and a model girlfriend all of the kind of things that I thought I wanted and I was totally miserable and you know, I realized that I'd, I'd come so far from from my values from my beliefs and I looked around at all these other rich and successful people um, and they weren't really happy either you know and it, it dawned on me that there would never be enough girls, there would never be enough money, there'd never be enough status. Um, I, I was trying to fill this, this hole in all the wrong ways. So in a, in a different way, I think, than you know, what had kind of been force-fed to me as a kid, I started with a hangover most days uh, to really rediscover my, my faith as, as an adult. And I started reading theology on this, this kind of beach in Uruguay, completely hungover, and I came back to New York um, dedicated to make a change. I was really searching. I wanted my life to look exactly the opposite. Uh, the 180 degrees really interested me. Um, if I was the most decadent person that I knew, you know, what would it look like to actually live out uh, you know, faith without hypocrisy? So I, uh, I struggled for a few months and I finally um, have an opportunity to make the leap and I'm going to leave New York. I'm going to go for the extreme and I'm going to apply to humanitarian organizations. And I'm going to dedicate one year of the 10 that I spent on myself uh, to service. So for a nightclub promoter to apply to humanitarian organizations is not actually as easy as you would think. So I was denied by every single organization that I applied to. Uh, most of them didn't even know what a nightclub promoter was or how I would in any way be useful to them. And thankfully, uh, one organization said, we'll, we'll take you as long as you pay us $500 a month. <laughs> Uh, and I had, uh, I had applied uh, to be their uh, photojournalist, and I'd always taken pretty decent pictures, so I put them up on a blog, and I said, you know, I can take pictures that are in focus, and I know a lot of people in New York. Uh, I'll come in and document your humanitarian work. So they said, okay. And in the, in the fall of 2004, at 28 years old, I left my, uh, my life um, for a new life in West Africa, uh, primarily in Liberia. So this became my new home. It was a giant a 500-foot hospital ship. Uh, it was a, a cruise line that had been converted to this hospital ship and they'd gutted it. Uh, they'd put in a 42-bed hospital ward. And the idea was pretty simple. You know, doctors from around the world would give up their vacation time and instead of flying to the Bahamas, they would fly to Liberia and they would operate for free every single day on people that needed help, needed access to medical care. And it was almost impossible to photograph anything in this country without capturing bullet holes. And a lot of you have heard of Charles Taylor and the 14-year war that he, he waged using child soldiers. I mean, it decimated the country. No electricity, no running water, no sewage, no mail anywhere in the country when I'd first come in. There were about 15,000 UN peacekeeping troops, which was the largest force deployed anywhere in the world 
at that time. And people were just living in, in bombed out buildings. So I learned quickly what I was actually going to be doing for the next year. Mercy Ships, uh, they were surgeons and they specialized in monstrous facial tumors. Now, I had never seen a facial tumor before in my life. I'd never seen a cleft lip or a cleft palate or flesh-eating disease uh, where people had parts of their face missing. I mean, I didn't know any of this existed. And apparently there was going to be enough work to keep an entire crew of 350 people busy uh, for about eight months. So I was told that we would screen patients and that um, it was actually referred to as patient screaming by the, the longtime veterans on the ship because more people would come than we had surgery slots. And on my third day, I remember rolling up to a stadium where we would see the patients and there were 7,000 people that had come for 1,500 surgery slots. And that was, uh, that was a moment, you know, knowing that we were gonna have to send 5,000 people home because we didn't have enough doctors, we didn't have enough resources. Um, also learning that some of these people had walked for one month just to see a doctor. Liberia has uh, one doctor for every 50,000 citizens. And here we have a doctor for 180 of us. So when you got sick, you were just screwed. There was no hope. First child in line, 5.30 in the morning. I, uh, they open the doors, and Alfred is the first to be seen. And this was hard, man. I saw a 14-year-old kid suffocating to death on his own face and gurgling and choking, and he was terrified. Um, and I was obviously terrified. So I ran into the corner, and I started crying. And I didn't know how to handle this. And one of the medical officers came over to me and said, you know, <laughs> kind of like, didn't you get the memo? Like, you signed up for this. This is what we do. Uh, toughen up and, and get through the, the patient screening and do your job. And I, I managed to pull it together and, um, you know, kind of latched on to Alfred. He became my first friend in Africa. And a couple of days later, I got to see him have surgery. And I saw these doctors operate on his face. And then I got to take him home a couple weeks later, sans tumor. Uh, and got to watch him grow up and heal. And it was, that was incredible. I mean, learning what happened, you know, because people served, because they, uh, they had come, uh, was incredible. I mean, story after story, this woman, Martha Lean, you know, she had this tumor growing for about 10 years. Uh, people thought she was cursed, so she would live in the back of a hut, and if she came out, she would cover it with the cloth that she has in her hands, um, and people would stone her if, uh, if they saw this tumor. It took the doctors about 45 minutes and he just gave her a completely new face. He just removed the tumor. It's just a benign tumor. So the, the year was, uh, was spent photographing, meeting some of the most extraordinary people. You know, these people were all heroes in my mind. They had hung on uh, in a country really with no hope and they were rescued and they were restored to health uh, by doctors who, who cared. So I signed up for another year. Uh, I didn't know really what to do next and I certainly wasn't gonna go back to the club business. On my second tour with Mercy Ships, uh, also in Liberia, I started learning about this issue. And there was one guy off to the side who would take some of the money of the organization and he would help a few communities, six or seven, eight communities, get access to clean water. So I had to photograph everything that happened and I would go out with him and he would show me the sources of drinking water. I remember you know, saying to myself and, and to him, he was a kid my age, I was like, dude, they drink this? Like I wouldn't walk in that water. I wouldn't let my dog drink that water. And he said, you know, it's, it's true. This is the only source of clean water, you know, within miles, if you're 50, 100 miles. And they use this water for, for drinking, for bathing. So he's like, you know, look, the, the irony is, Scott, that there's clean groundwater right underneath this village, right next to this swamp. So he would use some money and um, he would train the locals and they would dig wells um, using, you know, under the supervision of a couple engineers and we would pay for the PVC and the gravel and the pump and he would take me back a couple months later and I could drink the clean water right next to the swamp coming out from the ground and while I'd seen you know all these patients and uh, you know that was certainly moving this left such a deep impression on me you know, here was one guy off to the side really attacking you know the root of so much of this sickness that we were seeing and helping hundreds and hundreds of people you know, for about 20 bucks a person. So I came back to New York City, I was 30 now, my heart had been completely broken. I mean, I'd, uh, you know, when you see it, uh, I mean, it really changes you. And when you live it, um, I, my friends didn't know what to do with me. And the most incredible thing had happened on a, on a personal family level. 
uh, after 28 years of really being allergic to the world, uh, my mother had been completely healed. So I came back and I found my mom healthy. Uh, doctors didn't have any explanation for it. Um, our family just believes it's an answer to you know, three decades of prayer. We're not sure why it took so long. But uh, she was fine. I was able to like, give my mother a hug without making her sick uh, for the first time in as long as I could remember. And uh, back in New York City, my friends were still drinking $16 cocktails. And you know, I remember you know, I, I'd flown in. I'd gone straight to, to meet some friends at the Soho House, which is like a members club. And someone bought me a $16 margarita. And I was like, $16! You know, it's, it's a bag of rice. I can feed four people in Liberia. And you know, it was that almost, uh, I don't know, righteous indignation. So I, I quickly realized that you know, who the heck was I to judge anyone else? I'd actually sold $16 cocktails for 10 years. And instead of trying to make people feel guilty, you know, I should look at this as opportunity. Uh, we live in a world where people are willing to spend $16 on a cocktail, um, where people are willing to spend $5,000 on, on a handbag or $500 on a bottle of vodka. Wait till they hear of the opportunity to fix people's faces to bring clean water into communities that need it. So that was going to be my job, it was going to be to, uh, to bridge the gap. I'd seen a lot of problems uh, in the two years there, but the one that really jumped out, the, the, the problem that seemed to, to create so many others was the lack of access to clean water. And I needed to start somewhere. So I said, all right, Charity Water was born as an idea. I think it was written down on a napkin or stuck to, on a sticky note to a wall. Um, I started exploring water. And I, I, I'd known nothing about it. None of my friends knew there was a water crisis. Uh, you know, water came out of taps for us. We took long showers. The average American uses about 150 gallons of clean water every single day. That's just our water use here divided by population. Um, and a billion people didn't have access to life's most basic needs. So I grabbed the camera, started traveling around, um, and, and this is what you'd see. You'd see kids in Rwanda like John Bosco, and, and this is the only source he has ever had in his village. And you'd see kids walking with 20 or 40 pounds of water on their head. Um, some using repurposed diesel cans. You know, and they should be in school, but because the water is so far from their community, it's their job to go and get the water. Um, you'd see guys my age in Rwanda just collecting mud. And instead of having the money to buy the charcoal to boil the water, charcoal is a precious commodity. And in a lot of these countries, it's illegal to cut down trees. So they would filter water like this by letting it settle and then pouring it through cloth. So the women just use their dresses, you know, double and triple the fabric, and then pour the brackish water through it. The World Health Organization came out with a statistic that said 80% of global disease is directly related to a lack of clean water and a lack of sanitation or a lack of toilets. And some of these diseases, you know, you've heard of, um, Schistosomiasis was a, a particularly nasty one I'd never heard of, but about 200 million people right now have worms crawling towards their liver because they drank water that was dirty, water that was um, infected with feces. It's obviously not, the, uh, uh, not what you see in the water that makes you sick, it's what you don't see. This child in, in Kenya, um, this was tough, this, this little girl was drinking um, out of a tap that was connected to the Molo River. It was, you could just see this pipe going into a brown river. And she would drink and then she would vomit over herself. And then she would drink and she would vomit and she would drink and she would vomit. So you know, I remember we took the water away from her and we promised to help the area. Um, but I wanted to see what was actually in this. So I, I took this back through customs and um, gave it to a lab at Rockefeller University. I said, could you please put this water under a microscope? And they gave us a little video of what she was drinking. And they said, you know, we're not experts on all the kind of parasites, but you know, it's definitely alive. It's not good. Um, another problem that we kept coming across over and over again was leeches. Something I had never once, even in a thought, associated with drinking water my entire life. And community after community would show us um, the springs, the open springs that they were getting water from, and they would pull out the leeches. And they'd say, you know, the big leeches don't give us a problem. We can always filter them out. But sometimes the little leeches will get through leech, our filtration right? yeah. and they then they them? grow up inside and the favorite place for the leech is the back of the neck. It gets even worse. And then they take a stick and they scrape them off the back of the neck. And then they don't always die and they crawl back again. And you hear this time and time and time again from communities. 
learned that schools didn't have clean water and I was as passionate about education as, as the next person. I couldn't believe when I found out that about half of the world's schools didn't have clean water or a toilet. And all these kids here, you know, they go to the river at four or five in the morning, they have their little jerry cans, they get dirty water from the river and then they bring it to school. And it's a huge issue for the girls because when the girls hit puberty, they stay home from school for four or five days because they're ashamed. And the, the number one thing a girl will ask for is a toilet, even before clean water, so that they can stay in school and not fall behind in their studies. And then this was a stat that um, I couldn't believe either. I learned that 40 billion hours were wasted fetching water just in Africa. Um, to, to bring some meaning to this, it's more than the entire workforce of the country of France. So here was this really unrealized kind of global economy, you know, time that was, that was unproductive, that could be made productive. And it was backbreaking work, and um, it really destroyed the spines of the kids as well. You know, they start carrying water from five years old, and you would see girls this age and older women with nothing on their backs, and they were completely hunched over from years of hauling 40 pounds of water. Okay, so that's all very depressing. What I found, and what I, I think was... Um, shocked me at the time was that we actually knew how to solve this problem. There were many solutions. We knew how to bring, and we know, how to bring clean drinking water to every single person on earth, which is not doing it. And there was no you know, silver bullet. There wasn't a one-size-fits-all solution. But there were a lot of things you could do to bring clean water into communities. So sometimes, like my friend was doing in Liberia, the hand-dug well was the solution. And there was clean water at 40 or 50 feet underneath the village. Sometimes you had to bring in rigs and water was 1,000 feet under the ground in massive aquifers. Sometimes there was arsenic in the water and you could filter it at a community level, at a household level. Sometimes you could catch the rain and harvest it. Sometimes you could take mountain springs and build gravity systems that take them down to the communities. At its simplest, it cost about 5,000 bucks to help a community get a hand dug well. $20 a person, 250 people living in a community, and the community would donate the labor. They were more than willing to work on the project under the direction of some people who knew how to dig wells, and provided they had the cement, the gravel, the PVC, the pipes, the necessary materials. And it's hard work, it takes a couple months, and it takes a whole village, and uh, these concrete culverts are, are made and dropped one on top of another to form the lining of the well, and that means it doesn't collapse. They weigh about 600 pounds each. And a couple months later, you've got clean water coming out of the ground. The deeper wells cost more, 10, 15, 20 grand. Um, you've got a million dollar rig asset. You've got eight skilled drillers. But the cool thing is as you go deep into the ground, you just get more water. Um, you get a different source of underground aquifers, often huge, huge lakes living under these communities that have no access to clean water. And it's, it's one of the most awesome things to see, to be there for that day where the community gets clean water for the first time in their history and it shoots out of the ground and people dance and celebrate and throw popcorn and scream. Um, goes on for days sometimes. And what we saw is when clean water was brought into a community, it really changed everything. It began immediately to transform the lives of everyone living there. So kids were healthier. You know, they stopped dying of diarrhea. Uh, kids had more time to spend in school, so they were more productive. Women would tell us, that they would spend more time with their killed children. Some women would tell us that they are using the extra time and they would get a small business started. They would sell rice or peanuts or something at market, um, earning an extra buck or two a day. And what I loved about the issue was you could actually know that you'd made a difference, right? Clean water was flowing or it wasn't. And, and it was provable, it was tangible, it was testable. UN came out with a, an 88 page report saying every dollar that you invest in clean water and sanitation returns $12 to the local economy. So this was powerful. Water not only, not only made people healthier, it improved education. It made people a lot richer. Time savings, health savings. Sustainability was a really important piece to, to understand and work towards and communities could be trained, they could be empowered to maintain their own water points. And you would set up uh, caretakers and vice chairmen and treasurers and secretaries and village sanitation workers. And it would, the project would be handed over to them and they would collect a little bit of money from every family using it that would go into a corpus and you would have a, a structure, a group of people to manage the water project over time. 
So what were we going to do about it? Um, at the time, I was $30,000 in debt because nightclub promoters are awful at saving money. We were really good at spending it, bad at saving it. I'd given almost all my money to Mercy Ships, flying back and forth and um, paying my, my dues on the ship. And I had this big vision, you know, I, I, I wanted to, to use the rest of my life to make the biggest impact possible. And I specifically wanted to do two things through Charity Water. I wanted to solve the water crisis before I died and see a day where every single person on earth had clean water to drink, I know that sounds ambitious, and reinvent charity. I'll talk a little bit about this. Um, I hadn't really made a charitable gift for 10 years, and I had a lot of excuses. And the main excuse was, ah, charity's a big black hole. You know, so little of my money is actually gonna reach the people in need, and you know, it's run by bureaucrats, and it's just not efficient. So I thought that, that there was room for a new model and a new way to do charity. So starting it on the, on the couch of a, of a nightclub promoter friend, uh, in debt, not knowing how I was going to do this, I had a couple big ideas at the beginning. And I thought, you know, wouldn't it be amazing if we could answer the question of how much money goes to the people the same way every time, and if that answer could always be 100%. People laughed at me and they said, you know, well, that's ridiculous. You know, you need to pay staff and you're going to need an office and how will you run the organization? Um, I actually didn't know, but I thought that, uh, that it might be possible to find a small group of people who believed in that, who would allow all of their money to be used uh, to help staff and pay the organization. So I remember going down to uh, Commerce Bank at the time in New York and opening up two bank accounts, uh, one where all of the money from the public would go and never be touched except to be spent on direct water projects, and then this other bank account where I would try and convince some friends to help me build an organization. Um, the integrity of the 100% was so important to me that I also wanted to pay back credit card fees. So if, if someone made a $1,000 donation and American Express took 4%, we would actually raise the 4% on the side, put it back together, and send all $1,000 to the field. So uh, kind of wasn't sure how that would play out, but uh, went for it anyway. The second big idea was to prove where every dollar went, to prove where 100% of the money went. This was actually simpler to me. Uh, charities hadn't done a great job of, of linking you, linking us, to where our money went and using technology to do that. In our case, it was going to be simple. We would be funding water projects around the world, very tangible things. And I'd gone into, uh, into a Best Buy and I'd seen that handheld GPS devices cost about 100 bucks, And cameras cost about 100 bucks. So for $200, you could turn on a GPS device, photograph it, next to the water point and know exactly where it was, within about 10 feet, anywhere in the world. And we said, great, we will never fund a water project anywhere in the world unless we can be guaranteed that it exists and get photo and GPS proof. And this would allow us to monitor them as well over time. So from day one, all of that information was put up on Google Earth and Google Maps. Um, if there were 5,000 water projects, there'd be 5,000 photos and 5,000 GPS units. The third idea was, uh, was a little more um, abstract, but I wanted to build a brand. And you know, the nonprofit sector is not known for its excellence in branding and marketing and storytelling. But I thought to solve a problem this big, we would need to develop an epic, epic brand. We would need a brand that rivaled Apple or Nike or, or Coca-Cola. And Nick Kristoff had written in the New York Times a very provocative quote. He said, toothpaste is peddled with more sophistication than all of the world's life-saving causes. So I thought this was broken. And I didn't think you needed to spend a ton of money to build a brand. You just needed talented people, and you needed good taste. And I thought you could make pretty much anything look good. Um, you could take a, a dirty drilling rig, and you could productize it. And you could tell people what the different components cost and link them to it. So day one of the organization, the only thing I knew how to do to get this thing off the ground was to throw a big party. Promoter birthday parties are notorious, where we get to call in all of the favors, and you have to come to our birthday parties if you want to get in the club for the rest of the year. So I had been out of the club game for about two and a half years now, but I said, I'm going to throw a big party, I'm going to give everybody open bar, and I'm going to charge them 20 bucks at the door. So not very ambitious, but 700 people came, probably more for the open bar than, than for my birthday. And, uh, and we raised $15,000, so a very small amount of money. We immediately took that $15,000 to northern Uganda, where we fixed three wells, we built three new wells, and then very importantly, we sent the photos and the GPS to the 700 people that came. Um, I joke that some people don't remember coming to the party, 
thought that it was awesome and that you know they had been very generous and uh, that you know in, in seriousness that, that a community of people 700 people had actually affected the lives of a refugee camp in northern Uganda and were able to see that and to look at those projects on Google Earth it was very powerful this this idea of closing the loop and we committed to try to do that um, at every point as we built the organization um, so we, we did cool stuff uh, we built e-cards um, and used every holiday as, as an excuse to, to come up with new creative. We sold them for 20 bucks. Cost $20 to give someone access to clean water. So for Valentine's Day, for Easter, for Hanukkah, for Christmas, sold over half a million dollars of e-cards. And the cool thing is we could connect senders and receivers to water projects. Um, we worked with our friends at Tom's and we created products that raised awareness and money. We created ad campaigns. You know, we had no marketing budget, but we figured we'd be able to get donated ad space if we had good creative. And then we didn't always need to take ourselves so seriously. We could have a little bit of fun with the brand. Um, and then sometimes we were very serious and tried to bring some of these numbing statistics to life. And I'm sure there's some parents here. You know, how many parents or how many of us in general could imagine 4,500 kids dying? Even a, a room with 4,500 kids, but maybe giving your child death in a baby bottle would get people to think differently about the issue. And we got tons of donated media, both online. Um, Verifone just donated a thousand taxi tops in New York and San Francisco and Boston. And we've had buses driving around with these in New York. This was another idea, shooting rich people in the same situations as the people we were serving around the world. So, you know, imagine if it was your mother or your grandmother who had to drink water with bone and hair in it, or your kids that went to a $40,000 a year prep school that had to haul water on their backs, or your, your son, or your banker friends that had to go to a pond at the lunch hour in their fancy suits. And we took over galleries and, and tried to just confront people with these images to challenge their thinking around water. Our first PSA was a 30 second spot that we did on a $4,000 budget. Um, Jennifer Connolly uh, from A Beautiful Mind donated her time. It was directed by Terry George who made Hotel Rwanda and he helped put together a crew of, of 50 people, 50 or 60 people. Eventually got $4,000 out of me to pay for the Penske trucks. And uh, this was our first 30 second piece. That ran on uh, American Idol first in a million dollar donated spot seen by over 20 million people. Um, finally got us off the couch. This was office for the first year. Um, someone had told me that there was an office nearby and it could be ours for only a couple thousand dollars a month and it was the most beautiful thing I ever saw. Covered in grease. It was an old printing press and we got about half of this space. Um, and then worked to get a beautiful million dollar headquarters donated in New York um, and just about everything in it donated where our team works today. Um, we went to Saks Fifth Avenue. This was fun. We said, you know, you guys sell $5,000 handbags and we have $5,000 wells. You know, we should totally do something together. <laughs> they said yes. Uh, they shot their Mother's Day and their Father's Day catalogs completely in water. Um, and then they gave up the windows on Fifth Avenue after Giorgio Armani brought his windows down. Let us put up these images and tell, uh, tell the story for seven days in New York City. And then they went to their customers, to their employees, and they raised $700,000 as a company to bring clean water to 140 communities. McAllen came to us, and this was even stranger. They said, you know, we have whiskey, takes a lot of water to make whiskey, and we're all based in Scotland where there's a lot of water. What can we do? <laughs> wow, uh, we're not sure. They, they got the idea. They came back to us and they said, we found a 64-year-old whiskey. What if we took it on a world tour and to taste our finest whiskey ever made, you had to drop $5,000 for 10 centiliters, about this much. We were like, <coughs> really? Yeah, they gave us a $605,000 check from one bottle of whiskey. Helped 23,000 people get clean water. And we got kids involved, as you can imagine, students did the most incredibly creative things to raise awareness and money. Uh, we threw a big gala in New York City, which was not a stuffy sit-down dinner, but really an experiential event where 2,000 people would come um, experience the water crisis. They would carry 40 or 80 pounds of water on a fashion catwalk 
littered with facts about death and disease and dying. Uh, and companies would match every person that walked. So you would walk with a reason. And just by walking, you would trigger two or $300 donations uh, that would go to water projects. Um, we loved uh, social media. We were the first charity to reach a million followers on Twitter. Loved just telling our simple story uh, through social media. People need water. Here are the solutions. And we can show you the impact that you've made. This was probably our biggest idea and, and a way that every single person in this room and everybody watching could help. On our one year anniversary, I was just going to do another club party, but it didn't really scale in my mind. I mean, maybe a bigger club, uh, I don't know, charge 30 or 40 at the door. I thought, well, what if I did this virtually? And I told people just to stay home and donate my age in dollars, 32 bucks. And everybody I knew pretty much had 32 bucks that they could go and find. So I, I email every single person I know and I wound up raising 59,000 bucks for my birthday. And I said, wow, this is you know, four times the opening party. We didn't even spend any money. We didn't have to do anything. I said, everybody has a birthday. Everybody could care about clean water. Um, Seven-year-old kid took this idea in Austin, Texas. And he went around you know, knocking on doors, asking everyone for seven or 77, uh, even 777 from some, some key placed people. And he raised $22,000 with his seventh birthday. So I went to uh, the Bebo founder, Michael Birch, uh, and said, you know, would you help me just create a, a simple website where people can give up their birthday or, or other fundraising ideas and then we can track every single dollar to the project with integrity because 100% of the mon money sits in this vacuum. So he helped me design my charity water a couple of years ago and it just took off. You know, we saw people like Justin Bieber give up their birthday, send out a couple tweets, raise almost $50,000. Jack, who created Twitter and Square, you know, it's done three birthdays now, raised over $200,000 actually. Kristen Bell gave up her birthday, raised 100 grand. Will and Jada Smith gave up their birthdays, but they inspired their fundraisers and, and their fans to become fundraisers. Um, Adam Lambert, I'd never heard of at the time, but uh, he's, he had a $29,000 goal for his birthday, and he knocked it out of the park with his fans. Um, Nona gave up her 89th birthday, and it wasn't always about the money. She did not even raise $89. Um, she could not figure out how to get my charity water to work. But she wrote a really beautiful mission statement, realizing that she was double the life expectancy in many of the countries where we were serving people. It quickly grew beyond birthdays. Um, some friends were climbing Kilimanjaro, and I challenged them to try to raise a dollar a foot, and they raised more. Um, a church in Seattle wanted to do a benefit concert to, to do three water projects, and they wound up raising $300,000. They said people came in, they, they pride themselves as being the only church in Seattle with a liquor license. And they said people walked up to the bar and dropped $5,000 and ordered a glass of wine. Tax accountant in Midtown, this guy Steve Saab is unbelievable. Single-handedly has raised over $400,000. And he said, Scott, it's simple. You know, I know how much people make and I know how much they give to charity. I shame them. <laughs> We eventually set him up with multiple credit card terminals and like a Google Maps on a flat screen. Uh, people were really creative. They jumped out of planes. Um, so many people gave up weddings and honeymoons. I mean, that was really, really powerful. Imagine not going on your honeymoon and donating five or $10,000 towards a water project to give a community clean water. Um, literally people who did not have wedding ceremonies to bring clean water into communities. Uh, people sailed across the Atlantic Ocean. Five groups now have walked across America in solidarity of the people walking. This takes four months. Uh, and a nine-year-old girl ate rice and beans for a month, trying to do one well, and she wound up doing three. So my charity water, just in its beta, has done over $13 million, um, triggering 175,000 donations. The really exciting thing behind this number is that all of that money has been raised by 12,000 people. And the average campaign is raising over $1,000 from about 13 different donors. So we launched dollars of projects, and you know, we'd promised people they could see where their money went. So we spent about nine months working on a product called Dollars of Projects, and this is what it looks like. If you fundraised, and even if you only raised a dollar, but I'll use Graham, he tried to do one water project. And he wound up raising a little more. So he raised 6200 bucks. We send his money to the field. All the work is done. We audit it. We take the photos. And then we say, Graham, here's where your 6291 went. See your project portfolio. So he funded all of the water project at Mayorato, and we use actual costs here. That one cost $3,400.88. He funded part of a school well, which cost $15,000. And if he clicks on the projects, he can see 
the information about the community, how many people live there. Um, he can see which of his donors actually funded that project. He can see the photo gallery of his water project. And he can click on Google Maps and see that it's in northern Ethiopia, and if he zooms in, that it's near a school. Every one of his donors then gets an email saying, hey, you gave $39. See exactly where your $39 gift, where 100% of it wound up. And that's been really powerful, and we're excited to, um, to be sharing this information with people. You know, many of them had forgotten, and, and uh, you know, it, was, it was a while ago, and they're, they're blown away that they could see where their money goes. Um, so in five years, we've raised 60 million bucks, uh, which is not a lot of money you know, towards this issue, but we've done it really through a quarter of a million generous donors around the world. Um, we've helped two and a half million people in 19 countries get clean water to drink. So that's uh, about 6,100 villages. So right now, there are over 1,000 people right now um, in 19 countries working on charity water projects, locals, uh, indigenous staff through our partner network, of, uh, of, of drilling organizations and such. We've actually only solved one five hundredth of our problem. Right? So two million out of a billion. So we, we still have a very, very, very long way to go. If you think of, uh, of the gap between what we've done and where we're going, where we need to go, um, if you think of it in seconds, um, two million seconds is about a month, about four weeks of seconds. And a billion seconds is 32 years. So we're like a month in, uh, in a very long journey. Um, but we were at two weeks a year ago and added almost a million people this year. Um, in fact, this year uh, alone, we were able to help 700, over 700,000 people get access to clean water, which is over um, one person per minute, 2,000 people per day. So we're starting to really see impact and scale. So we're going for a big goal. We want to help 100 million people by the end of the decade. By doing this, we think we help even more because we've spread so much knowledge and expertise out through these communities. We've um, increased the capacity of our partner organizations around the world. Um, so that's the goal, 100 million people. We figure maybe we can make the, the homepage of the New York Times, our local paper, if we pull that off. Um, and we will need to do the impossible for a charity. We will need to raise at least $2 billion for clean water. That's 65% year over year growth. No charity in the history of the world has ever grown like this to scale. Um, and we're starting to see it happen. Uh, we did 77% last year. We did 86% the year before. Um, this is in contrast to a sector which, unlike yours, is, uh, is actually in trouble. So giving numbers have been down 7%, down 6%, and got two of them back in 2010. So we are, we are not running this like a traditional charity. We're running this like a startup. Um, like a business, except we have no equity and um, we get paid like crap. Uh, so I'm going to end just with two stories, um, bring it back to the people. Um, one of the best things about my job is I get to travel constantly um, to the, the communities and meet the people that we serve. This was a place in Ethiopia. This is as bad as it gets, called Ghazi Springs. And the kind of dark spots on the screen are, are cow urine and cow poop. And the women are trying to get to the eye of a spring where clean water comes out for a second and then immediately turns to mud because it's unprotected. And they asked us for help. Um, our partner explained that the, this was a really easy solution. Uh, the solution here was building a giant concrete box around the eye of the spring, throwing on a couple taps, and chlorinating it once. And it would cost less than $5,000. And I was like, please, whatever you do, fast track it. I mean, people must be dying drinking this water. Um, it, was, it was hard to see, you know, seeing kids, seeing the women hunched over. You know, there was no dignity in this. So the partner said, great, we, we think we can get this done in a few months. Um, they put it towards the top of the list. I went back four months later, and that was the water people were drinking for $5,000. That was the mud pit standing in the same spot. So they were, um, they were trying to bend over right around where those white plaques are. And this is Gede, who is the 18-year-old um, healthcare worker in the village and she says, you know, it's been amazing. Water's made my job so much easier because now I'm using the, the clean water here to talk about hygiene, to talk about sanitation. She said the community now has even all built dish racks. She said that was pointless before, but now that their dishes are able to be clean, they want to keep them clean. The final story is, uh, is a woman named Helen. And, you know, I th I think of water in very typical ways, and we know that it, it improves health and education and it makes people richer. I'd never um, thought of it in this way before until we met Helen. 
And Becky uh, Straw, who was our, our water programs director at the time, was, uh, was up in northern Uganda. And she was trying to sneak in to Helen's Village to see our water project. Normally there's a lot of fanfare, the community hears you're coming and you know, they throw a party. They are so grateful uh, for, for the clean water that they surround you and you can't really get anything done for a half hour, an hour until that ends. So she was just going to sneak in and observe the community using the water point. So that didn't work um, as Helen blocked the road. <laughs> So she was really happy. Becky, uh, things quieted down. She said, you know, Helen, tell us um, how this community has been helped. How has your life changed? And Helen said, well, I had it really bad before. So I had, I had a family of, of four, a husband and a couple kids, and I had two jerry cans that I could take every day because I had to walk for my water. And she said, I had to make these choices every single day. You know, would I drink? Would I cook? Would I clean the house? Uh, would I wash? Would I you know, clean his kids' school uniforms. If they turned up at school dirty, you know, they weren't allowed to go. Would I water the garden? She said, I never had enough water to do these things. So, of course, I put my family first, and I always came last. And she said to Becky, she said, now with the clean water, I am bathing so well. Becky's like, you're bathing so well. And she said, now for the first time, I feel beautiful. And yeah, Becky, like, just took that in. She said, wow, you know, Helen was able to wash her face for the first time. She had enough water to wash her face, to take care of her own personal hygiene. And of course she was beautiful before, but the fact that we were able to make someone feel beautiful, to restore that dignity, um, was such a powerfully uh, unintended consequence. So I'll end there. Um, challenge you guys, if you want to help, uh, if you want to help people like Helen bring clean water into communities, uh, you could give up your birthday. That's a really simple thing. I've done, I think, four now. Uh, people love it. You ask for your age in dollars, all the money goes directly to projects, and you can share those projects with your entire community. Uh, maybe there's something wider we could do at LinkedIn. Um, I mean, think about how many birthdays you guys could help us trigger if we did something together. And, um, you know, a thousand birthdays uh, is over a million bucks. Uh, so I'll take a couple questions. Thank you guys so much for listening and for having me. The question I have for you is, uh, you obviously invested in uh, building new wells. Have you also uh, engaged with people to do recycling? Because that's one of the common uh, good use cases to get more value out of the water you pull out of the ground. To do rehabilitation or recycling? Uh, recycling the water and reusing it. Reci um, re recycling plants and so on. Are they? We, so we haven't done any big infrastructure stuff. We're, we're mainly working and we're really focused on the, the low hanging fruit at the moment, the rural communities. So we're not working in the big urban centers with any big infrastructure projects. So it's, it's pretty typical small solutions. We've done some peri-urban stuff, so we're, we're starting to move towards that. But what we found is that the governments are focusing their water dollars and their infrastructure on the cities. That's where the voters are. Um, they are not bothering to drive out into the, you know, the rural villages. Uh, so that may change at some point, but you know, we're not doing these kind of you know, $10 million, $20 million systems or plants. Um, I think there's some exciting things happening there. I mean, desalinization, the cost of desal has come way down even since we started. It's still way too expensive for rural communities or even for, uh, for developing nation communities, but it seems to be headed in the right direction. Um, so that might be an option someday. You know, some of the filtration system is coming down in cost. But what we found is really simple things work. And if we can get consistent water from the ground, um, it's, it's there 10, 20 years from now. Thank you. Hi, thanks for sharing your story with us. Can you talk a little bit about partnerships with other organizations or nonprofits that have a similar mission as Charity Water? Yeah, um, we have, uh, we do a lot of kind of sharing of knowledge with other nonprofits. So I'll speak at a lot of conferences about fundraising and you know, some of the things that we found to work. Um, we are talking about a partnership with Room to Read at the moment uh, where they're building schools and we would do the water piece at every school. 
So I think we are looking for ways to collaborate. Uh, we have been very focused on not expanding you know, too quickly outside of water. I mean, we're really focused on water sanitation and hygiene for a billion people. So we encourage the other you know, water nonprofits in the space. There's some people doing great work at water.org and Water for People. And um, you know, we want them to be 20 times as big you know, and, and working at the problem in innovative ways alongside of us. And in fact, many of those that we partner with or fund. So for instance, Water for People you know, will we'll bring in millions of their funding this year. And they'll go out and implement in innovative ways. Um, same thing with some of the organizations you might have heard. So I think in, in ways of partnerships, we would be almost a meta. So we have funded 25 different organizations that specialize in drilling or water solutions in these countries. And what we found is that some of the best people at implementing the work are the worst fundraisers and the worst storytellers. Um, so we don't, uh, you know, I wouldn't see Charity Water getting into owning and operating drilling rigs in 20 countries. We really want to make our partners better and stronger. And just this last year, we took our best partner in Ethiopia and we bought them two drilling rigs because they had shown you know, great stewardship over the rigs that they already had over a 15 year time period. So we wanted to be able to grow faster, to be able to drill more wells. Um, through our really online grassroots community, we raised uh, money for a $1.2 million rig, you know, 20 and 30 bucks at a time. Um, we're about to throw a GPS unit on it so people will be able to track it. And then someone matched it with a second rig. Hope that answers your question. Hi, uh, thanks for coming. I was wondering if you guys did any work on Capitol Hill or work doing policy changes on the local international government level. We have not done any of that. I get to DC about once a year. Um, I, uh, I think we would need to hire someone that really had the dispensation for that. <laughs> I think, uh, you know, we, we don't have a great foundation strategy. We don't have a great kind of um, DC strategy. We've really focused on the thing that we've been good at, which is in individuals. Empowering individuals that know nothing about the water crisis, giving them tools to, uh, to play a part, and then connecting them to it. So I think uh, you'll, you'll see us stay focused on that and try and, and really build that for a while. Um, it might be a partnership. We've done partnerships with one campaign before uh, around the Water for the World Act and, and asked our supporters to, um, to get involved in a one initiative. But I don't, I don't see us in the short term kind of getting too much into policy. Uh, I just don't think it's a, it's a strength of ours. You'd probably see us partnering with someone uh, a lot sooner. Just out of curiosity, if, if you could change or enact any law you wanted right now, what would it be? I would be more funding for the issue. It would just be getting more funding for the issue uh, around the world. It's severely underfunded, uh, especially, you know, the, the, it would be getting people to understand that water really does sit at the root of so many of these other symptoms that we're trying to fight and throw money at. And if you can get water right, you do so much extra and then resourcing it that way. All right, thank you. Thanks. OK, last question. OK, I'll make it a good one. Better be good. <laughs> Again, thank you so much. This was a very inspiring talk. Thank you. And I, I had a combination of, of two questions. One of, what do you think has been the, the secret to the success of Charity Water? I mean, obviously, this is a very successful uh, charity in, in a world where there's a number of charities. And yet, Charity Water has, has, has risen very quickly, and uh, I'm sure much of that credit goes to your passion and, and your drive, but there have probably been a number of factors, and I'd love to hear what you think are the key factors to the success of Cherry Water. And looking forward, as, as you continue to scale the organization, what do you see as the biggest challenges of scale for your organization? Okay, so I think the first one, um, I think we just do a couple things pretty well. We, we are visual storytellers, so we show instead of telling. Um, we tell things simply. You know, I can't tell you how many times I'm with a nonprofit founder who talks to me for five minutes, and I really don't know what they do at the end of it. I think we've just, everybody here knows what we do. Like, Charity Water goes and they help people get clean water. So we've, we've been able to tell our story. It's actually a very complex issue. And I could, you know, I could give a whole other talk on the benefits of hygiene and sanitation and health numbers and stats, and you know, I could come at this in a very different way. Um, but we've really tried to keep things simple. And then people that want more complexity, you know, we're happy to share 88 page documents with them. Um, or, or water reports you know, around the world. So I think keeping it simple has been really important. Um, using visuals, so using, yeah, the organization's made four or 500 videos in-house with a team of one or two. 
people that have worked on video. So really, you know, cranking out, uh, really shipping uh, video content, you know, photo content, stories from the field. I think the 100% model has been really uh, impactful. So the, a lot of the people that give to us really don't trust charities or they've gotten burned or, or they had, you know, some sort of horror story. So knowing that uh, not only can they give 100% of their money and knowing where that goes, um, then I guess, you know, four would be showing them the impact. You know, so these, these photos, these GPS, you know, trying to link, you know, that, that's really, that's, that's our core mission. Um, the what we do is we bring clean drinking water to a billion people. You know, our, our why, our kind of what we believe is that you need to be connected to the person you're helping. And if we can really make that connection meaningful and we can do it with integrity, you will continue to give and you will continue to help and it'll transform you know, your life. So I think being clear on, on that, um, you know, good design I think certainly doesn't hurt. Uh, you know, I mean, I've been on some pretty bad websites that make it hard to give, that make it hard to understand. Um, as we scale, if you'd asked me a year ago, I would have thought the, the biggest challenge would be finding enough drilling partners. We had a really great year where we got ahead, so I know where I can put 50 million and I'm pretty sure I know where we can put 100 million. I think it's building you know, an organization without any access to, to VC funds or capital markets. Or, you know, we, you know, all my friends running around are like, yeah, I just raised a $10 million round, raised a $20 million round. Um, you know, we don't have that luxury. Uh, we don't sell uh, a product in a traditional way. So we need to kind of raise all the money for our staff operations separately, um, which we've found a great group of about 100 people um, who support us every year in that. Uh, to, to build the organization. So we're, you know, we have to kind of eat what we kill. We can't, uh, you know, we don't get that big cash boost. So that just makes it challenging organizationally. And finding great talent. I mean, we can't pay uh, what Facebook can pay. We can't pay what you guys can pay. We have no stock options to give out. So people that are motivated by money don't come and work at Charity Water. And, you know, we've got to really find people who are passionate about our mission, about, uh, about changing the world. So that's, uh, that is actually a limiter. Trying to hire coders, man. <laughs> All right. Well, please join me in thanking Scott for sharing his amazing story with us. Thank you, guys.